Hey everyone, this is Rocky from WeLearnChess.com, and this is the start of a new series. So I've got a few different series that I'm kind of nibbling away at uh, over time. I've got some different videos on facing the fried liver, how to play the Polaro defenses black. And uh, I started that video series on the Danish Gambit. I'll probably make one or two more parts to that. Uh, and this series is going to be on facing kingside pawn pushes in the King's Gambit Accepted. So if you watch my channel, then you know that I like to play this um, Fisher defense. Uh, and one of the things that I haven't liked so much about the Fisher defense is that even though I feel like I'm kind of always getting strategically winning positions, sometimes you get you face some serious attacks and it's hard to uh, defend properly. But I will say that um, I think that there's more counterattacking potential to this opening than I really have been playing it with. Um, I've just kind of been playing it, try to stay solid, uh, get into an endgame and win that. But there are some ideas with counterattacking the white king, um, especially when white moves his kingside pawn. So he's already given up the f-pawn, so this dark square diagonal is a little bit weak. So sometimes you'll get tactics on this diagonal, uh, which is why you usually see white play c3. Sometimes that's even not enough. Um, but... Um, yeah, if he starts pushing the h-pawn to h3 or to h4, or the g-pawn, um, he does open up in a potential attack to black's king, but in the same time it's double-edged because he also opens up his own king. Uh, now there are some lines against the uh, these accepted lines where white plays for an immediate h3 or h4 right in the opening, and it's one of the tougher moves to, to face, at least for me. So I wanted to start to study this a little more and make this series. Um, those games will come in the future where there's there's even some gambit lines uh, with pushes right in the beginning where like well it's already a gambit but like extra gambits sacrificing more material sometimes one or two pieces just to get an attack uh, especially down the F file so I'll look at some of those really sharp lines uh, video by video in other videos but for the first one I wanted to just show a game that that came up for me the other day and it's the reason why I started this series because um, for once, I was actually able to punish Wade for these uh, kingside pawn moves. Uh, and it kind of clicked with me a little bit that I should be looking to do this kind of thing more often. So um, so I just wanted to show this. I'll show very quickly some of the game just so you can see how we got to the position. Um, yeah, Wade is already starting to play aggressively in the center. And on the one hand, it makes sense because my king's still in the center, but uh, in these... Setups usually black is castling kingside. I mean, it would take way too long to try to castle queenside, and it's often hard to get your pieces out to the right squares anyway, um, especially getting your queen out of the way. Uh, so, yeah, castling kingside actually makes a lot of sense, even though it, it seems weird that you've moved these pawns here. Uh, so this pawn push, I actually don't know how much it, it accomplishes. Um, I just let it sit there, because if he ever takes, I can always take back, and this pawn on d6 keeps a knight out of e5, which is nice. Uh, it does become an isolated pawn, but... Um, you get something for giving something there, I think. But, uh, okay, I just let this sit here. And pushing here, sacrificing this pawn, I mean, King's Gambit players are, they love to sacrifice. I mean, they'll just sack, sack, sack all day long, and sometimes they win, sometimes they lose. But, uh, yeah, you can pretty much almost count on it. So keeping your position solid sometimes is is almost a win in itself because they get impatient a lot of times. Um, I didn't really quite see here. I mean, I saw that he probably would play this, but um, I just got this bishop on this weak diagonal, probably even pinning the knight would have been useful. The only thing about pinning the knight is like if I had played to g4, maybe it would have encouraged him to play h3. And um, that having the pawn on h3 actually stops black from pushing g4 at some point later in the game at an opportune time when he wants to create an opening, like when he's ready to counterattack. So I kind of like to not play the pin to not encourage this move. Um, I've, I've played a lot of King's Game players who play h3 anyway. Uh, probably to try to slow down those attacks. But, um, okay, and anyway, I just played here. I don't think it was the best move, but it seemed okay. I didn't really get his king move here because it seemed like he was preparing maybe to push pawns, but he didn't do that for a while. And um, we'll see that actually this move ends up becoming a problem. Uh, he also lost a tempo here, and losing a tempo um, when you've invested quite a bit of material is, is tough. I mean, here, well, okay, he's invested two pawns, but... It's not like he invested a piece yet, but it doesn't take long for him to get there. So I just wanted to develop uh, this pawn on d5 is a little bit annoying because it has control a little bit of uh, c6 and e6, so it's hard for me to 
try to develop there. And I don't want to start breaking this open and opening lines for him. I like that this bishop is kind of ineffective right now. So, um, you know, if he wants to make it a better piece, he's probably going to have to consider trading it off, which is why I wanted to get on this diagonal. But okay, so uh, he hits my bishop. I wanted to keep it for now because it's light squares. Uh, diagonal's pretty weak. Uh, and yeah, he comes in for the uh, typical uh, crazy sacrifice here, but I mean, sacrifices are a lot of fun, and I love to play attacking chess, but, um, well, what can I say? I've made plenty of unsound sacrifices, too, but this was just uh, not working at all. I mean, there's there's nothing here whatsoever. I got an awesome outpost square for my knight. He's down too much material. Um, here I can probably simplify it in a couple different ways. I felt like this was a little bit better. Just come right back to e5. There's not really a thing he'd do. He can win a pawn, but uh, he's still down material, a lot of it. Um, I snapped up this pawn, not because uh, I'm a pawn grabber necessarily, but um, I just felt like if he was potentially going to win a pawn or two over here, I didn't want him to start like wildly flinging his queenside pawns down the board and maybe trying to create a deep pass, pass pawn in the middle game. So I did take that. Um, probably this, this is probably an okay move, but he's always kind of eyeing my rook on a8, so eventually I have to waste some time getting my rooks out of the way of each other. I just drop back here. Um, I don't really see a reason not to take this pawn because this knight is so firmly anchored and you know he can take once on it with the bishop if he wants but I can even take back with the bishop or even with the pawn and I mean unless he's going to like sack an exchange on top of all the other material that he's invested he's not really going to be able to break through there. So um, yeah the queen here is on a good post not only is it still keeping an eye on the eight but it's also looking at this weak square. After your f pawn gets traded you'd have to remember that you don't have an h7 pawn either so um, you got to be really careful. So if he does something like here, which I think he tries in the game, take this knight off, and then hopefully comes in here with the, the queen. But um, I was pretty much able to not allow that. I think <laughs> taking this ball is probably unnecessary. But, um, I mean, I don't really see how black can attack me at all here, so it felt pretty safe. Um, I got one rook back here just to add some protection, and here comes the h pawn push. So the reason for this series, it happens quite late in the game, as you'll see, but I face this quite a bit. And so I'm starting to learn about this idea of drawback chess a little bit and kind of look at, okay, well, you, every move in chess has an upside and, and has a drawback. So, you know, what is the drawback and is there a way to take advantage of it? And usually the drawback has to do with uh, squares that were previously defended and are no longer defended after the move. So like if I move my knight away, like right now my knight is protecting a lot of squares, right? With the eight squares that it's looking at. So if I were to move my knight somewhere, then of course those eight squares would all of a sudden become undefended. Uh, it wouldn't make sense to move it here, obviously, but I'm just saying um, for the sake of explaining that drawback idea. So here with the h pawn push, okay, well, um, now he can't ever play h3 to stop g4, so that's g4 is undefended. Uh, also, if this pawn comes off the board, for example, a trade here, which we'll see in the game, then the h file is open, and the king's on the h file, so that's not uh, it's not looking too hot. Uh, for the white king, probably worse for him than for me, although my king's a little open too. So there's a couple weaknesses with this move. And a lot of times I think I fail to take advantage of these uh, pawn pushes by white. I just kind of let myself get attacked. So I'm going to have to try to uh, look and see if I can um, counterattack more. And I was able to do that in this game. So uh, first I just wanted to get my rook out of the way. I just, I mean, I'm up a lot of material, but it doesn't seem like I should leave him with any potential tactics where... You know, if I ever move my rook to take something back and he can take my rook with check or something like that, and I mean, it seems unnecessary, so uh, I figured he would take this, and also me taking here, I don't really think that makes any sense, it just allows his pieces to, uh, like his rook to come in, so uh, letting him take was fine, and now the h-file is open, and now his king h1 move looks a little bit uh, useless. Uh, okay, here he can win a pawn, I mean, he hits my bishop and he hits my pawn, I mean, I might even be able to just leave my bishop and start attacking, but... There's no reason to give it to him. If he wants a pawn, he can have it. He's still down, what, two, three, four. He's down two pawns and a couple pieces, so uh, nothing doing here. Uh, so everything's defended now. I can go ahead and start to look at counterattacking. And uh, one of the common ideas that you'll see when this h file is open is try to get the queen in the light squares. And uh, this is actually a theme that uh, we'll see in some of the other games I'm going to look at, too, where the h-pawn push comes earlier in the game. Uh, also, sometimes if the g-pawn has moved, the h3 square becomes weak, so that would be the drawback to moving the g-pawn. And sometimes the queen, when it's on this light square diagonal, can come up to h3 as well. Uh, so, okay, well actually, 
it could even come up at this point. It's the, the uh, G pawn's pin, so even if the queen was on this diagonal, it could come in there. But okay, so um, I just moved my queen over. I left it on this uh, on the seventh rank just so that it could keep the pawn dive defended for a moment. Not so much because of the material, but I just didn't want his queen trying to come in and cause trouble. So um, yeah, now he's in a lot of trouble. I don't even know if there's any way to defend this. Um, the queen is obviously coming to the light squares. He saw that he was about to get attacked, but after his next move, I don't I don't think there's any way to avoid checkmate, except for like blocking with the queen and giving it up. And uh, yeah, with the knight coming in, probably he could have sacrificed the exchange actually, or, or got rid of that knight. Um, but still, it's hard to imagine that he's going to be able to survive without getting mated. Um, here, there's here it's just mate, but uh, yeah. So I guess one defensive idea might have been to, before moving the queen back, to take this knight if he saw that potentially this attack was coming. I think probably either move makes sense. I like bishop takes just because, um, well, okay, yeah, if rook takes and I lose the rook with check, so there, <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, and if you were to take here, then I would have to take with the pawn, obviously. But I like this idea because these dark square diagonals are incredibly weak, so at some point I might be able to push uh, f3. So now if he decides to come back... Let's say here, and I get this check in. Uh, yeah, I mean, I even like the idea of pushing now because uh, now I'm threatening mate here on h2, and uh, also obviously just getting a pawn into his position. Uh, I'm covering these squares with my bishop, so they're they're uh, nicely defending my position. So, for example, if this pawn moves, it's not like he can come here and mate me, or well, it wouldn't even be mate, but uh, cause problems. Here, I mean, he probably might even have to sacrifice the exchange. I'm not really sure what else he can do. Either capture probably makes sense, but I guess capturing with the rook and I'm threatening to actually maybe come in here or something like that. So, uh, And I don't think he can let me take this pawn and, because then he'd be threatening mate here on h1, so he probably has to either take that or push. Probably pushing is a little bit safer, but uh, yeah, even if something like push, and then I've got, <laughs> I've got a protected pass pawn, in his territory and uh, threatening to do things like just queen up, rook over. I can even triple. And now my king is totally, totally safe. So, um, you know, this light square is defended, the rook's protected, everything's good. So, so it's totally lost as well. I mean, I, it's kind of a moot point at this point because he's given up so much material. And when you give up that much material, you just basically have to mate your opponent or have some devastating attacks that have to go up their queen or something. Uh, and that obviously didn't happen in the game. But yeah, I don't, I'm not sure what other way he could defend. I mean, trying to run with his king, maybe. But uh, that looks like it runs into all sorts of problems because the queen's still going to come over. If the queen ever comes to, like, f2, we've got checks with the knight on different squares, potentially forking and uh, uncovering all kinds of attacks. So yeah, I think um, that was a fun game, and it was a nice way to start out the series with uh, the h pawn pushes and the weaknesses that they leave behind and... Uh, some ideas for counterattacking. So the main thing we looked at here was after the h file is open, trying to get your queen onto the light squares because your pawns are on the dark square, so you have to kind of maneuver it through. So either here or getting it up through this way, even sometimes if this pawn's pinned onto h3. So we'll look at uh, more h file and g file attacks in coming videos, but I wanted to start with that one. And uh, of course we'll look at videos by uh, by much better players than myself in most of the other games. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that one, and I'll see you around.